thing. That, so the robot has just announced that. Um, thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Goodman. I'm the director of our Institute for Bioethics. Uh, and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to uh, the latest in our series of Dialogues in Research Ethics. Today is special for a bunch of different reasons, one of which is, is our speaker. The other is why I've asked her to be our, our presenter, actually. Speaker is the wrong word. Um, we have been doing this for 29 years at the University of Miami. Uh, Dr. Altman, I, I, every time someone logs on, your, your space in the Hollywood squares here moves. <laughs> Norm, Norm Altman was, was, a, was a real source of inspiration uh, 29 years ago when we got this started and has been a steadfast supporter of what we've been doing ever since. Um, but in those 29 years, we've actually had so far 199 presentations. And I wanted to do something special for this one. A little better. I and so therefore, to... um, therefore uh, it, it seemed like a great idea to ask, to ask our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Christine Grady from the National Institutes of Health uh, to, to help us with this discussion. Uh, we, we call them dialogues and research ethics because we want them to be as informal as possible. We want there to be an exchange. Uh, as opposed, that's why we don't call it lectures in research ethics. Uh, and, and so when Dr. Grady agreed to do that, it was, it was a real treat. Um, uh, she is, as, as you know from the flyer, senior investigator serves as chief of the Department of Bioethics at the NIH Clinical Center. Uh, she's been uh, a colleague in the bioethics research community for, for many years, uh, not just because of her role at the NIH, but because of her scholarship uh, on, on these issues. Uh, and so I want to thank you again very much for being here. I also uh, want to, to, to underscore the fact that Dr. Grady is a nurse by training and, and, and her, her work in bioethics has emphasized some of those aspects. And so it's a real treat to recognize Dean Cindy Monroe, uh, Dean of our School of Nursing, Nursing and Health Sciences, uh, and ask you, Dean Monroe, to give a few remarks. Yes, it is such a pleasure to be here. I, I have such high regard for uh, the UM Miller School of Medicine's Institute on Bioethics and Health Policy. And I think one of the really wonderful things about the Institute is that it does serve as a resource and a gathering place for people across all three of UM's campuses. And so I am very appreciative that on this very special 200th occasion for the Institute uh, that they are featuring uh, the work of a nurse ethicist uh, related to the NIH. Ethics is really a central competency for all disciplines, particularly the health disciplines and the scientific disciplines. All science and including nursing science depends on an ethical foundation and we cannot have rigor or reproducibility or scientific um, impact if we don't have a central requirement for ethical behavior in all of the people who are planning, conducting, and reporting research. So I am so pleased that although the Institute resides in the School of Medicine, it really does look across the disciplines at how we all can improve the ethical conduct and the and the work of the scientists at the University of Miami and beyond. It is a real pleasure, I think, to have a nurse ethicist with us to speak on this. And uh, Dr. Christine Grady has such a stellar reputation, both in the nursing world and in the world of ethics that I am really looking forward to this. Thank you, Ken, for making it happen. And thank you, Dr. Grady, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Monroe. Indeed, where something is located is sometimes an artifact of institutional structure. Um, <laughs> our, our institu so I'm a philosopher with an appointment, as you know, in the School of Nursing and Philosophy and others. And so yes. um, it's, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of quick, well, clicking and dragging under, under different sorts of administrative nodes. In any case, let's th thank you very much for that. Um, so let, let's begin very broadly. I, 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 as, as we all know, the, 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 the the lodestar for a lot of what we do when it comes to ethics, especially research ethics, it begins with the NIH. I was hoping, Dr. Reed, you could share with us a little bit about that, the history of research ethics at the NIH. Why, 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 why is this the center of gravity, the mothership for us? Why is ethics important to the National Institutes of Health? Yeah. Well, first, before I answer that question, I want to first thank you for inviting me, Ken, and also 
um, recognize that since I'm the 200th, maybe that's just because I'm old enough to have been around for decades that, you know, it makes sense to make me the 200th speaker or conversant in this, in this series. And I also want to thank Dean Monroe because I can't agree more about the need for ethics at every, in, in every discipline at every level. Um, that's music to my ears as a person who spends her life doing ethics. Now, specifically to your question, I think, you know, um, research ethics is something that has long been a part of what we do at the NIH. And so th there's a wonderful history that, you know, we don't have time to go through all of it today, but let me give you some highlights. Um, I work in the clinical center, which is the hospital at the, at the NIH. And in, when the clinical center opened in the 1950s, in 1953 to be exact, um, one of the things that it was planning to do right from the get-go was not only research on patients, but research on healthy volunteers, which was an unusual kind of thing in those days. Um, and so the clinical center medical board at the time decided to put into place a pre-review of all studies that were going to be done with healthy volunteers because they were worried about the ethics of doing research with healthy volunteers. And mind you, in the mid 50s, you know, bioethics wasn't even a word. Um, understanding what the ethical issues were in research was very young. And in those days, there was no, you know, system, there were no regulations about pre review, there were no uh, regulations at all uh, governing research with human subjects. So it was very prescient of them, I think, to put that review committee into place. And what's interesting about it when you think about it historically is that it, they only used it for research with healthy volunteers because research with patients was like, you know, patients are patients, you do what you do to them. So that was the kind of thinking about it in, in that era. Fast forward, 1966, um, the director of the NIH, not just the clinical center, but the, the whole NIH was a guy named James Shannon. And, and 1966 was in, in many ways a sort of watershed year for research ethics because that was also the year that uh, Henry Beecher published his famous paper in the New England Journal. But <clears throat> Dr. Shannon, I think actually even pre-publication of the Henry Beecher paper, raised an issue to the advisory committee that we ought to have review by peers of research for the ethical considerations of research before they began a research pro project involving human, human subjects. And he proposed it to the advisory com uh, committee at the time, um, and they debated it, adopted it actually, and that became actually the precursor for what later became the public health, public health service recommendation for IRB review, which is something that ended up in the regulations that followed a few years later. So, so I like to think that NIH was sort of the place where a lot of um, what we now think of as important parts of protecting human subjects and and paying attention to research ethics actually did start at the NIH. Started both in the clinical center and with Dr. Shannon. Now you may all know there's an Office of Human Research Protections that currently does not reside in the NIH. It's part of the Department of Health and Human Services. But its predecessor, the Office of Protection from Research Risks, OPRR, did reside in the NIH for a long time. Started in the 70s and until they, until somebody thought, well, maybe this is a little bit of a conflict to have the oversight office be in the same institution as uh, where most of the research is being funded. So it, it was moved to the Department of Health and Human Services to re reduce the possibility of that conflict. So that history helps helps understand well, the evolution of how we address these issues is, is important. And the challenges that we face are shifting all of the time. Right. Uh, you may remember, now you're probably not old enough, <laughs> uh, the, the war on cancer. Now we have cancer moonshots. It used to be a war, raising sure. separations about why we use combat and battle metaphors for half of these things. Yeah. But 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 when when we began doing this in, in the 1950s, there were no electronic health records. And if and and while there was racism in our society, it was not uh, something that we were attending to on a regular basis. 
So the importance of human subjects protections and uh, especially in a clinical research center like yours has evolved over the years. How, how help me uh, and your colleagues think about how nimble we need to be as, as, as the world turns and changes. Yeah, I think the basic premise of <clears throat> research being essential to robust research has not changed. Uh, I think as how we understand how it should be essential to robust research has changed over time. And so, you know, I'm, I told you the story about the healthy volunteers in the, at the clinical center. So there was this idea that you know, we were asking healthy people to be part of research, you know, is that okay? And how to think about what, what that, what was acceptable and what was not in that kind of situation. And I think the evolution of research ethics has continued to ask that question because as, as we all know, you know, when we're doing research with people, we're actually not, our main goal is not helping those individuals in the, in the research study, but it's answering research questions. And so we want to always be sure that the research question is worth asking, that the risks that we're asking people to assume are worth they're assuming them given the, you know, the value of the research question and that we ask them with, you know, as full transparency as possible, whether or not they want to do it. And, and those things are sort of universally true and have continued to be true. Now, now we're in, you know, a year of pandemic, let's just recognize. And there have been a whole host of really challenging research related ethical questions. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, I certainly have spent time on and some of my colleagues as well. And, and they, are, they are not whole cloth new from things we've struggled before, but they, they have new dimensions, okay? So for example, you know, how do you, how do you protect against moving too fast um, without compromising? without compromising science or ethics. Um, when in a setting that we're living in, in a global pandemic, there is a desire, a justifiable desire to move fast. We need answers. We need answers now. We don't need to spend you know, years developing research studies and getting them approved and started. We need to get them started, get them done and get the answers so we can move on to learning everything else we need to know about this global pandemic. And so I think it's created some interesting issues for research ethics because you know, there is a way in which research, in which the systems that we have put in place to protect human subjects and to make sure that research is done ethically um, have become a little burdensome and, and take a lot of time. And so, Thinking of ways to expedite them without compromise is, I think, a really interesting challenge. And then I think there are some really interesting challenges in the setting of a pandemic related to what's, what's acceptable ethically and scientifically with respect to study design. And that's not a trivial question. And we have certain, um, you know, long-standing views about what's acceptable under certain circumstances in terms of design, but the, the constant tension between, the constant tension that we should always feel, but that we feel much more intensely during a pandemic is, what's the design that's going to get us useful information as quickly and efficiently as possible without compromising either science or no ethics or the, the kinds of things that we believe were important in both of those domains. So I went on a little longer than probably you wanted me to, but. Well, I think I was going to ask you about COVID, uh, that it's been some kinds of test of that model that's evolved, right? Yeah. We do science to uh, biomedical science, health science, uh, including this topics related to social determinants of disease because we want to improve the health of our population. Uh, yes, somebody might get promoted along the way, somebody might get a grant, but, but the motivation really needs to be, we want to improve the health of our population. And, and given some historical facts, so, so 1950s was before Tuskegee became public, right? 
Sure. Uh, and and that has shaped a lot of a lot of our responses to these questions. Uh, I'm sure you'd agree that, that one should not have needed Tuskegee in order to care about protecting human subjects. Right. But mm, we did, or at least that that shaped our response to it. Um, in in terms of code, just just because a lot of people, there's a lot of studies at, at our institution and others uh, related to COVID, from from vaccines to, to therapeutics and that sort of thing. Um, has it worked out okay? I mean, taking a tried and true model for protecting human subjects in the middle of a novel health challenge, um, it looks from the outside like we've done a tolerably good job of it. Maybe we've done some breathtakingly good science, especially in terms of immunology and vaccinology. We've done it in record time. And it seems that, we, that, the, that our ethical rules have worked up, uh, our ethical guidance, I don't, like, I don't like the phrase ethical rules, that our attention to ethical issues has held us in good stead. Yeah, I, I agree I, with I agree with that. I think we, I I agree with several things you just said. One is the sort of surge of COVID-related research has been remarkable, and that has been uh, both uh, a testament, really, to incremental science because it's built on science that came before it. To, to be able to allow us to go fast, and a testament to um, the, I don't know, flexibility is not usually a word used with, with research ethics review, but, but flexibility really in terms of making sure that priorities were set, that people worked you know, hard to get things done in an expeditious way. And um, I think, you know, some of the outcomes of the research that has been done during this pandemic has been remarkable and the success stories are, are you know, unprecedented is the word that everybody keeps using. I think at the same time, and this is something that I, I think we need to keep in the rubric of, of research ethics actually, is how well we are engaging with and um, communicating with the public because some of the mistrust that still exists or is actually getting a lot of attention um, is because of a concern that we went too fast, that the research was done too fast. And some of that is without full understanding of all of the steps that are built into the process of doing research, both in terms of the science itself, but also the review and approval and oversight. Um, a lot of people don't, well, they don't have a reason to, but they don't, they don't know all that story. So the story needs to be told, yes, we went fast, but we didn't skip steps. We didn't compromise. We had a lot of um, eyes on and a lot of people paying attention to the very specific details of what studies were being done, how they were being done, how the data was being reviewed, and um, decisions that were made based on data. That's a point actually that I could have used this morning. Uh, we have a, so there's a vaccine uh, a committee for our institution, and we were talking about those who are reluctant to uh, who are reluctant to take the vaccine yep. because quote unquote it was developed so quickly, yep. implying that all the safeguards that are normally in place had somehow been set aside. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question about when you have answered a question in biology is a great question. It comes up in the context of data safety monitoring boards and stopping rules all the time. Namely, at what point do we need to change course based on the data we're collecting? In right. this case, it moved forward quickly and that was not an issue. Right. Um, and, and, uh, <laughs> So next, next, and, and, that, and that point signaling, I, mean, I think the NIH, uh, I don't know how much, how much public communication is part of your remit, but that, that these are not, the, the rules may strike investigators as onerous, you know, and the IRB application may strike some as, as, as a burden. Um, and, and that's just too bad. It's, it's there for a bunch of really good reasons, but that more citizens would do well to know but these processes are in place precisely to address those concerns. Absolutely. And I think, again, your point about the DSMB is an important one. I would 
venture to guess that most people that you talk to in life who are not in a research institution would maybe never heard of a DSMB and certainly wouldn't know what a DSM, what the role of the DSMB is. And in the case of, you know, the let's just say the vaccine research for COVID, that that did go faster than any vaccine research in history. I mean, that is true. Um, the DSMB was very involved in looking at those data on a regular basis. They met multiple, multiple times to, to look at data. And, you know, the, the FDA guidance was, if there's a vaccine that has greater than 50% vaccine efficacy, then we might be able to authorize it for use. And lo and behold, when they looked at the data in the first interim analysis, the efficacy was 90 plus percent. And so that seems, you know, it seems like the DSMB did their job, the FDA did their job, and, you know, 90% plus efficacy is a sort of slam dunk in terms of, yes, we should be using this vaccine. So I, I saw a funny cartoon the other day. Someone said, uh, it was something to the along the lines of, you've been eating hot dogs and chicken McNuggets for years, and now suddenly you're worried about what you're putting in your body? Uh, <laughs> that, yeah. that we, that a point that, that's been made, I think is compelling more, more serious than that is that I, I, there, there, are, there are clinicians in this room and elsewhere who prescribe drugs tested on smaller populations. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, we, that the, we do the science not, not to oppress people, but to learn how to improve their health. And, the, and the, if there's trust in the process, that matters a great deal. I find there's great ignorance, though, among a lot of ordinary people about this process. Sure. And that's a challenge for all of us, and our, especially our institutions that do research. We love, we love waving our arms about how we're doing the research. Yep. Um, but, but the rules under which we undertake it are sometimes not, not part of what's on the marquee. Uh, by way of transition, and so, so related to, to, the, to the, the governance, the guidelines, the rules, the best practices, one of the things, there are several colleagues here who, uh, I mentioned Dr. Altman earlier, who helped us. This is part of our, our Responsible Conduct of Research program. Um, uh, Sergio and Tom Chantney and Joanna and others uh, help with our ongoing education there. Uh, Ken Muller, I think, tricked me into doing something along the way many years ago, and he's a, a stalwart in terms of doing this for our for our science science uh, scientists and science students. Does does so the, so the how you carve this bird, if you'll forgive me, uh, has sometimes there's a public health component. Which is a sort of a branch of bioethics. There's a, a clinical component, a branch of bioethics, and there's a there's an RCR component, a, a branch of ethics. When it comes to the responsible conduct of research, as all of our institutions grapple with how how to get this right, um, would you would you say the same thing that those that those rules are holding us in good stead? And that'll be a transition for me to ask you to talk about education and all of this, uh, yeah. and, how, and how how to get it right in terms of education. Yeah. So I think. Certainly the idea, and Dean Monroe said this earlier, you know, the idea that research should be done responsibly is an ethical idea, you know? Ethics is, and I, I say this all the time, absolutely essential to good research. It's absolutely essential. And so responsible conduct of research is a big umbrella to me that under which a lot of important aspects of how to do ethical research fall. And they, and they go from, I mean, you all know this, but you know, they go from simple, not simple, but straight self-evident kinds of things like, you know, honesty with your data and um, respect for the collaborators and things like that to the, to the more complicated details of how to protect the human subjects and how to analyze data uh, in, in the most ethical way and interpret it in the most ethical way. And so, so many important parts of responsible conduct of research. And I think, you know, unfortunately, from my perspective, actually, some people have in their minds, at least, separated RCR from protection of human subjects and protection of animals. And I mean, there are other domains here that, that all fall into the same in my mind, the same umbrella. I like to think of them as 
They are all research ethics. They're all research ethics. They're all important parts of research ethics. There are rules in each of those subsets and the rules are pretty good. Um, the challenge often is making sure that the people who need to know how to follow them understand what the rules are and also have some both um, basis for and resources to help with making judgments because um, sure there are rules but they're not they shouldn't be used as checklists because the sort of nuances in any particular situation require judgment, require reflection, require people to think about, okay, how does this apply in this case to this study or to this research participant or to this, you know, collaboration? Um, and so, you know, giving people the tools to be able to do that is a really important thing in addition to some rules. To underscore that, I mean, when, when we do our, our RCR course, of course, it does follow the, we talk about animals and we talk about humans and we talk about mentorship. Right. Uh, we talk about data management, publication and authorship and so forth, right? Yep. And, and to a point that if, if ethics were merely about a, a, a grid that you could fill in, we wouldn't, well, any of us, well, at least you and I might not have jobs, right? <laughs> the critical analysis is precisely what we do. That yep. these were that, that you wouldn't know what to require or forbid under any regulatory system if you didn't know what was what you ought to do in the first place. Right. And that is very often not going to be simple. Yep. Uh, we have great challenges about data sharing, which I know, which I know is, is a huge topic at the NIH. Mm -hmm. How under what circumstances ought we to share data? Mm -hmm. Especially when I may think it's um, well, one, obviously you can't be completely transparent if the data is about an individual patient, mm -hmm. right? Um, challenge related to intellectual property. I mean, one of the trickiest parts of our RCR curriculum has to do with conflicts of interest mm -hmm. and how we manage those in our institutions. Yep. It was, yep. it was ethics analysis of the sort that you described that got us there in the first place. Yes. And I'm sure you guys use, you know, I, I mean, there are different models for teaching these things, but I think cases are often very useful because cases can you know, can vary one or more of the parameters of the case or the contextual features of the case and demonstrate in that process how things change based on some contextual factors and how you then have to have other considerations um, to bring into the fore. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a, in, in the intramural NIH, we do um, um, annual, I don't know what they call it, scientific integrity, I think they call it, um, training, which is required of every laboratory in the entire uh, NIH. And it's all case-based. And, it, and every year, the sort of theme or, yeah, theme, I guess, of the cases changes a little bit so that you get some variety. And it's really quite interesting to um, not only discuss those cases with my own group, but to observe other groups that have that do very different kinds of scientific work than we do um, and how they discuss certain cases. And, and it's really, really, it gets people to really think hard about, you know, how do you make these kinds of judgments? How do you understand what the rules are telling you to do? What do you do if you think something is wrong and the people that you're working with or for don't agree with you? You know, I mean, there's so many levels of um, really putting it to the test, so to speak, in terms of making sure that everybody's on the, on the same page in terms of knowing what are the basic rules, but also um, given the opportunity to struggle with how to apply them because they're not black and white, they're not checklists, they're, they're things that require reflection and, and judgment and discretion. So our colleagues here should take some comfort that the source of the rules itself grapples with these judgments. That there's, there's ethics education at the NIH, which is the source of the rules for ethics education. Uh, <laughs> precisely because this, there, the, if, if, there's, if it were really simple, we, we would have had it by now. Uh, it might be that information technology gives us a good example of that, or data sharing, namely that that when you can analyze de-identified data, 
the rules for consent might change a little bit. Uh, what's now possible in the context of broad consent might be an example of that. That the, that, that the rules, the guidance, the governance, and the education change all the time. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing, right? Well, it's a good thing as long as it's done thoughtfully. You know, I mean, the, the rules have to change, might have to change as there are new areas of science that we didn't have available to us in the, you know, in the past. I mean, in de-identified data, is, you can get so much of it. You get so rampant, you know, we have to have some thoughtfulness about how we use it. Um, and also whether or not and under what conditions and how we get consent. So whether or not to get it is one thing under what conditions you get it, and then what kind of consent also matters. And, you know, it's a great example, Ken, of um, how, at least I think, none of these things, that, that struggling with how to do it in a particular case is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. That there are rules, but, you know, taking the time to say, okay, in this case, you know, what can we do? We, we recognize the sort of, um, respect for the individuals who we're getting data from to be able to give us some permission to, to use their data. But how do we do that in this context? What, you know, what kind of level of interaction do we have with them? What kind of information do they need to have? Um, how do we know if they're making a, a, a choice? You know, I mean, there's so many uh, sub layers, I guess is the word I would use in terms of, you know, how do you actually apply the things that we all believe are important. One of the things that, uh, as as we as we, I I, I want to avoid terms like like uh, that imply anything negative. But if you do this, and many people on the call do this, to get to teach these things is actually interesting and fun. To have a, a research ethics consultation service, yeah. uh, which we've tried to support for many years, is interesting. When your colleagues say, "Here's here's one for you." Uh, because the rules couldn't possibly apply to every case in advance. This is the problem with laws, regulations, and civil society, right? You right. cannot anticipate everything in the future. No. And so Rex kind of critical analysis in the classroom on the counter. We help our colleagues it's with all not... that. Um, sh share with me what you talked about different cultures earlier. And, and one of the reasons why I'm really excited you're here and Dean Monroe is here. I see a number of students from, from the School of Nursing are here. Um, good research teams are interprofessional, uh, and that brings together different challenges related to, to practice and uh, sometimes even power dynamics uh, in institutions. And, and I was hoping you'd talk big and for a second about interprofessional research uh, yeah. and particularly the role, the role of, of nurses in, in, in the kind of science that we do. Yeah. So first of all, I think we all know that um, the discipline of the people who are PIs on research studies varies. You know, we think of clinical researchers as mostly physicians, but there are a lot of people who have PhDs in different kinds of scientific areas. And then there are nurses and people from other clinical backgrounds who are PIs on studies. So, and, and, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because, you know, every health problem has different dimensions to it and the perspectives of different disciplines that different, different, different disciplines bring to the table in terms of studying what's important about a particular condition or a health problem, um, I think adds richness. But as you said, Ken, the, the second part of this is that you know, t research is a team sport. You can't, you can't do research by yourself, nobody can. And so every research project has a team and the team is best, um, best serves the purpose of doing the research if you have members of the team that represent the groups that you need um, their perspectives brought to the table. So um, if it's a clinical kind of research study, you know, oftentimes, even if the PI is not a nurse, the study coordinators are nurses or the people who take care of the participants who are in the study are nurses or the data collectors are nurses, or all of the above are nurses. So you might have nurses as a, an integral part of any research team, but you also have other, other people from other disciplines who are an integral part of any research team. You need statisticians, for example. You need um, 
you know, data collectors that have different skills, maybe inform informatics kind of skills. So, you know, research teams, are, no research can be done without a team is my, in my view. Um, the team could be small and it could be large, but research teams need to have as their members, uh, the people that will contribute the, the things that the research needs to get done and done well. So that's really, really important. Um, I think that, you know, nurses are essential to research in so many ways, because even if they're not part of the research team, um, in a clinical research environment, nurses are the people who take care of the patients. And there's a interesting and sometimes ethically tense uh, pull between being a clinician and taking good care of your patient and supporting research. And so nurses often, I think, and, and physicians get in this position as well, um, are, are struggling with, you know, the roles. How do, how do we, how do we play both roles, play them well and do it ethically and, and protect the person who is the participant in research who's so important. So, yeah, I, it's interesting. Uh, you know, there's a organization called the International Association of Clinical Research Nurses, which has grown dramatically in the last couple of years. And they've done an, a great job really of putting together competencies for research nurses at in different roles, but also educational programs and, you know, just a community of professionals that can help to sort out some of the things that nurses in various roles in research uh, have to play and get and struggle with. Seems to me sometimes that nurses are, might even be, and, and other, like anybody on a study is going to find, the, might encounter the possibility that there's something that needs to be addressed, something that's not quite right, something that, um, uh, I, 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 the, the being free, feeling free to say, are you sure about our process here? Right. Uh, I'm concerned about documentation of consent in that population or, or for the sake of some regular, and, and then making sure that everyone on the team is encouraged by leaders to raise those questions. Uh, that, that the reason we have them is not to get anyone in trouble. The reason we have them is, right. to, is to do better science. And sometimes, uh, especially if you, as you point out, if nurses are going to be in such an ongoing, close, intimate role of taking care of patients who are on studies, then their role in making sure that we get it right is lens to this. Absolutely, absolutely. And it goes back to what you said earlier about, you know, institutional culture and power dynamics. I mean, I think um, in my lifetime, <laughs> I've seen uh, respect for the contributions of nurses change. And yet it varies from institution to institution, even from unit to unit. I mean, it, it really does. And um, my soapbox has been for decades, actually, um, that nurses have an incredibly important role in making sure that research is done ethically. And in order to be able to fill that role, they have to be able to speak freely. They have to be able to raise questions and say, is this really how we want to do this? Or have we thought about that? Or, you know, and, and have avenues within an institution to get help when they need it in terms of um, making sure that research is done ethically. It also makes our lives a source of case studies, right? The, the, your point earlier about case studies is a good, a good lattice on which to, to hang a discussion. Yep. Well, you, you don't need to go online to find case studies. We have them in our clinical research uh, processes and units, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You also mentioned research ethics consultation services. I, I guess you have one. Is that is that right? We we do. It's on the website, and, and it's in it's informal. People usually, well, they call me if it's in the middle of the night. I tell them to call Sergio. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but 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 yeah, we know we've been doing this. We've been doing this for quite some time, ranging from human subjects to animals to uh, we we actually um, uh, years ago tried to work on a project. I don't know if Dr. Altman remembers this on create on how the creation of transgenic animals is actually not well addressed by animal care and use committees. Mm -hmm. We don't know what what some of the things that as you go through the filter of, of, of things you need to attend to. 
there's just a lot we don't know. Making so making decisions under uncertainty, which captures the, the empirical uncertainty, which captures the threat that you've identifying, requires yeah. more open discussion. Absolutely. So yeah, we 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 do that, and uh, uh, and we do it on all three of those campuses. That's great. Uh, the reason I asked, I mean, I found I've been part of a research ethics consultation service now for probably two and a half decades. Mm -hmm. And I find it surprising, but also intellectually stimulating and actually, um, I don't know, say satisfying, but I'm, I'm glad that people raise issues, you know, that the issues that get raised on a daily basis in terms of doing research well uh, are not necessarily ones that we've figured out before. You know, they keep coming up. There are a lot of uncertainties, as you said. And and sometimes, you know, we use what we know from the rules and the experiences that we've had to try to make sense out of a, a new situation. And, and I think it's very, very interesting. And research ethics consultation is, an, is a great thing for institutions, institutions that do research. And, and, so, and since we've been encouraged, it also helps send a signal that when we do this, when we try to attend to, to, to education, I much prefer education to training, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but nevertheless, when, when we do this, the ways of doing it involve identifying these cases and making it clear that we're all grappling with this. If it were merely compliance, then that would be trivial and, and, and we could do it easily. It's precisely because of the uncertainties and that we encounter, as you point out, challenges that are new, that, that a better environment is shaped by being able to have these conversations. Yeah. It's also an interesting, I mean, I remember years ago, somebody, um, well, I was on the, I worked with Sergio during this time when I was on the President's Commission on, uh, for Bioethics. Um, one of the people who presented to the commission one day about research ethics education was talking about you know the the various online modules that exist that still exist but have existed for a while, and the description I thought was quite powerful. He said, "We're all required to do them. They have some of the basic facts in them, but they're mind numbing." And I thought that's a good description of what happens with you know rote information that's given to you in a module. Whereas what I found and I. I sounds like you have too. When you have live discussions about complicated cases, it's not mind numbing. It's intellectually invigorating because there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be sorted out in terms of, you know, how do we think about this now and how does it help us in the future? Um, and it's really, you know, it's a very different kind of way to learn about research ethics. It's almost as if, if, if those of us who enjoy teaching scientists or, or non-scientists who are doing science, which I guess makes you a scientist or a clinician scientist, if, if you were not interested in something related to your science, the, 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 your lack of curiosity would seem peculiar. Yeah. And what I think you may be, what I think you just signaled you discovered, I think I have, is that good scientists are not incurious about this. They were, they're interested in these ethical issues. They're mm -hmm. smart enough to realize if, if, if it were easy to do, we wouldn't need to have go to this much trouble. And then precisely because we encounter, without any intention of wrongdoing, it's when you, it's, it's if you think that ethics is a, a bulwark or a barrier against someone doing something bad, you've misunderstood the role of applied ethics in our institutions. Yep. Right? Maybe it'll help with that. We hope that it will, that education will improve behavior, generally speaking. But it's it's also a way to to it's a it's a it's a kind of a prophylaxis against being incurious. Yes, you should be <laughs> curious about the, the consequences of your research, uh, how to get it right, and that includes animals and data and people and and communities for that matter. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. You made reference to an international organization. I think there's a question here about about um, uh, Europe. Um, I don't know if my, my, in my experience there tends to be. Well, but international organizations, you know, there's, uh, we've been sharing copies of the, of the Singapore statement with our graduate students on research integrity and that sort of issue. Yep. Um, in, in your experience, are, are you noticing that, that there's, there tends to be broad 
agreement about these values. Because there's a lot, now that we're doing research everywhere, a lot of studies are not just multi-institutional, but they're multi-national. Um, are, we, are we going in the right direction, I guess, in terms of international harmonization on these, on these educational and, and practical requirements? Yeah. So this is a, not a new topic either, of course, you know, harmonization of international, uh, not only rules, but understandings of, of uh, wow. how we do research and how we do it ethically. Um, I think we've come a long way in terms, I mean, I think there are in different places around the world, different regulations. Sometimes those differences conflict with each other. Um, but the sort of basic principles that ground all of them seem to be increasingly recognized as universal. That would be my view. Um, I do think that, you know, when we're engaged in international research, the, the onus is on whoever's sort of sponsoring the research to make sure that there are lots of very clear discussions about what is acceptable in different places where this research is going to be conducted. And that's not only what's acceptable by regulation, but what's acceptable ethically as we interpret the regulations and decide what to do. And that's, you know, it's, it's tricky sometimes because, I mean, it depends totally on the research. I, I've been involved in some cases, for example, where, you know, the research is being sponsored by the NIH, by investigators who have wonderful intentions in terms of uh, finding uh, answers to questions that vex them with, with respect to serious health problems, you know, around the world. And yet, you know, there, there needs to be a conversation about, you know, how do you assure that what you're studying makes sense in the context of another culture or another country or with another set of rules? How do you, how do, you do that up front? both for, for acceptability, but also for respect, you know, for making sure that the research is valuable to everybody that's involved in conducting it, every place that's involved in conducting it. And those conversations are not, um, they're fraught sometimes. They're fraught with lots of, you know, lots of reasons, political and power dynamics and, you know, different understandings and lots of things, but they're, they're absolutely essential, I think, to good ethical research, collaborative research. And there's room at the beginning, I will give a 30,000 foot introduction to the history of, of uh, moral relativism, as opposed to cultural relativism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so in terms of many things, we say, well, that's interesting, we need to work with this culture in different ways. On the other hand, if someone is saying, but we've always discriminated against women. Uh, that's not the sort of thing I think should be regarded as a quaint local custom. Uh, that, that, and, and that can be really tricky depending on what you're studying, the vulnerable, especially if it's a vulnerable population, which in some countries, or many countries, women are. Yes. Um, I, wa I want to try, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know about you, but it's gone really quickly and we're in the last 10 minutes here. Um, I, I wanted to just, Again, to thank you. This the logo. I'm not sure. I, I a oh, wrong hand. Uh, I'm not sure that I like that logo. But this is our 30th year, uh -huh. uh, 29th of, of our institute, 29th of the series of dialogues and research ethics and so forth. Uh, and that you've been able to join us is well, it's a treat, and it and it, it it's a it's a kind of a it, it also signals to our colleagues that these are issues that one our colleagues at the NIH have been thinking about for a long time also and that they are there, you're here. I mean, you're spending time with us. Uh, I don't know if I was gonna get credit for, <laughs> for participating today, but what you've signaled is, this is what those of us who teach this care about. This is how we signal it's important. This is how we signal it's the way we wanna do research and how we achieve the overarching goals of research. So what I might ask you to do then, just by way of starting to wrap up and then, and then maybe if, if she likes, just also ask Dean Monroe to, just be, begin a conclusion by talking big about your work uh, especially in the context now, uh, you, you addressed a little earlier, the role of, of women, both as investigators and as participants, of minorities, uh, both as investigators and participants. And when that will draw to a close, I should mention my first grant at the University of Miami was an old 
NCRR grant on reducing the underrepresentation of minorities. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the argument was the NIH, it came from the NIH, is we're spending a lot of money on science and we're giving it to investigators at universities, but the people receiving it are disproportionately white. It's a form of government tax support that is not that is disproportionately shared because of the history of people who go into, into research. And so the point of the grant was let's get more, let's find a way to have more black and Hispanic scientists. Right. So with that, with that, with that uh, uh, invitation, uh, bring us to a close by talking big, <laughs> if you would. So I, I, I don't know if this is big or specific to what you're just talking about, but I think, you know, NIH, in my view, has been trying to figure out how to increase diversity in inclusion of research participants for as long as I can remember. And in the last, I don't know, <clears throat> 10 years or so, there's been a lot of efforts to really uh, focus on increasing the diversity of the scientific workforce. And that's, you know, in terms of providing grants and training and et cetera, across the world, not just in the, in the, um, not just in the United States. But I mean, I think everyone knows this year has been a wake up call for a lot of people about we're not doing as well as we could be on any of these dimensions. And so and I think the NIH has realized that as well. Um, some of you may have seen just in the last few weeks, the NIH um, uh, rolled out a new initiative called the Unite Initiative. And it's, it's a you know, large scale effort to try to increase diversity at every level of science. And you know, the, the Unite, I don't know if I can remember them all, but each one of those letters stands for something. Unite, U is for increased understanding. N is for new research in, in health disparities. Um, I is for inclusion. T is for transparency. And um, E is actually like ecosystem or something, the ecosystem in which this stuff takes place. And so there's a real effort to try to, you know, put it at the top of everybody's agenda, so to speak, in terms of making sure that we continue to find or maybe accelerate ways to find um, uh, effective methods of increasing inclusion of underrepresented people in research, inclusion of underrepresented people as scientists and scientific teams, um, and uh, attention to the issues that, um, the issues in health where disparities make a difference, you know, and they affect, affect, of course, individual health and public health. And so all of those things have to be attended to. And I, I, that wasn't the sort of big picture thing you were asking for, Ken, but I mean, I think it's a really important thing. I think in my lifetime, um, I have seen uh, much more attention to these kinds of issues, understanding the value of equity in all kinds of ways um, in, in my work, in my role as a nurse, in my role as a research ethicist. And I think, you know, I'm very happy that that evolution has occurred. It could, it will get better, but it's, I'm glad that it's, it's gotten as far as it has. And, and it would not be, I won't ask you to comment on this, but it would be reasonable to hypothesize that some of the reasons, among the reasons why it's gotten better is the work of you and your colleagues. No, uh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm one of those, thank you for your service. If, if you need more money for research, then please raise my taxes. <laughs> civil society. Uh, I, I, it's rumored there's some of our compatriots who might disagree with that. There, there are a few. <laughs> Dean Monroe, penultimate closing words. Um, yes, and, and I think I, I would pick up on this idea that um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion are sort of central to the health professions. It is embedded, I know for sure, in the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics for Nurses, that, yep. that, that it is a foundational part of our profession and the other health professions as well. Um, so, and I would say that at University of Miami, we have really wonderful opportunities 
to really engage in that work. And I know in the School of Nursing and Health Studies, we have a Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Training Grant, which moves uh, includes students from undergraduate all the way through postdoctoral opportunities um, in, in engaging and trying to grow people who are interested in health disparities research and come from a health disparities background. So I think that NIH has done wonderful things, some of which we've directly benefited from at the University of Miami to really level the playing field and improve diversity, equity, and inclusion for all people. So I am, uh, and I would echo the idea that it's been the ethics programs at NIH that really have led both the research agenda for the US and the national attention to ethics um, in our country. So I'm grateful to you as well. And to Ken for bringing you here. Thank you, thank you so much. Don't give, a, don't give me more credit than I deserve though. <laughs> I, don't, I don't make the NIH do what they do, but. I try. <laughs> but you definitely have, have moved their agenda forward, and we are grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. And our institution, before we sign off, just because they're in the top row, my, my, my colleagues, Norm Altman and Ken Muller, who've been encouraging me to do this for 30 years, um, in part, because, however you track the causal chains here, uh, obviously, you wouldn't want to accept that too readily, but that we believe that we're, our science is better because, because of ethics is in part because of the work of you and your colleagues. On that note, uh, thank you so much for being here on our, on our special dialogue and research ethics. For those of you who've joined us, thank you to you. Um, and um, uh, let, us, let us conclude with thanks and gratitude and the idea that we're gonna move forward and do more good science. It's good for people. Thank you, good Dr. Good science Gray. and good ethics. <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you so much for inviting me. Nice thank to you see you all. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, Christine. Bye.